I'm Salvatore Babonis, and today's lecture is the world system semi-periphery. The semi-periphery of the world system consists of the countries that are neither very rich nor very poor. Semi-peripheral countries are the ordinary countries of the world. Uh, life in the semi-periphery is typical of the kind of life lived by human beings in the world today. Semi-peripheral countries are also known as emerging markets countries because of their attractiveness to foreign investors, but there's nothing emerging about them. They've been fully integrated into the world market for at least 500 years. The middle income tier of the global economy is the heart of the semi-periphery, the group of countries that are neither rich nor poor. Um, as with the core, the semi-periphery is really a structural position, not an income level. But most semi-peripheral countries have middle income levels of $5,000 to $20,000 GDP per capita uh, per year. Some semi-peripheral countries are richer, like the oil sheikdoms of the Persian Gulf. Some semi-peripheral countries are poorer, uh, like India, which has a GDP per capita of around $1,600 per year. Uh, India may not be as financially well off as most semi-peripheral countries, but India shares the characteristics of other semi-peripheral countries. In particular, it has functioning state institutions uh, that may not be strong enough to support a leading global economy, but nonetheless uh, basically deliver services to most people most of the time. A defining characteristic of semi-peripheral states, however, is that even if they are basically functioning most of the time, they are highly vulnerable. And they're especially vulnerable to fiscal crisis, uh, to government budget crises. Semi-peripheral states simply don't generate enough tax revenue to be able to uh, pay their bills on a regular basis, uh, in particular in times of crisis semi-peripheral countries often have uh, trouble paying their bills and may uh, experience uh, bankruptcy or uh, come close to, uh, to bankruptcy, have to seek a bailout from the International Monetary Fund and other international organizations. Semi-peripheral states also experience repeated currency crises because they tend to borrow uh, in U.S. dollars instead of being able to borrow in their own currencies. As a result, when a crisis hits, uh, the country is unable to finance its own deficit and has to turn to international organizations, again, primarily the International Monetary Fund, in order to uh, meet uh, their financial needs. Semi-peripheral countries share many economic attributes besides just middle income levels. They Almost all have high levels of income inequality. They have endemic corruption at all levels of government, a dependence on indirect taxes. Uh, so instead of taxing income directly, they tax people indirectly through sales and value added taxes. And they tend to have underdeveloped private sector economies. Uh, they have economies characterized by high level of foreign ownership, high level of state ownership, uh, with local investors preferring the security of putting their money overseas in, uh, in government bonds and foreign stock markets instead of investing in entrepreneurship in their own countries. Investment companies have created two acronyms to represent the largest of the semi-peripheral countries as emerging markets for investors. Uh, the first is the BRICS. Now, the BRICS were originally the BRIC, B-R-I-C, and then plural S, BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. South Africa was later added to the grouping, making it the BRICS with a capital S. The mints are Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. All nine of these countries are very large semi-peripheral economies. Some of them are a little bit poorer than middle income level, uh, like India and Nigeria, but nonetheless, all nine of these countries share the basic attributes of semi-peripheral economies. Since semi-peripheral countries constitute most of the world, they're also home to most of the world's social problems. So for example, uh, migration crises 
are mainly centered in semi-peripheral countries. The European Union uh, is currently experiencing what it considers a massive uh, migration crisis of some one million refugees and asylum seekers coming to the European Union from the south and east. But consider that the number of Syrian refugees alone in neighboring semi-peripheral countries numbers four million. And these countries are much smaller than the European Union. Uh, the European Union has a population of 500 million people and is incredibly wealthier than uh, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Yet Turkey and Lebanon individually have each taken more Syrian refugees than the total migrant flow to the European Union in 2004 and two, uh, 2014 and 2015. Other refugee crises are also concentrated in semi-peripheral countries, in part because they don't necessarily have the ability to uh, police their borders to keep people out, but also because they come under strong pressure from core countries to accommodate refugees. Uh, this is very much a case of do as we say, not as we do, when countries and organizations based in core countries uh, try to uh, persuade or bully uh, sh uh, poorer semi-peripheral countries into accepting the refugees that rich countries don't want to accept. A very clear example of this uh, is in Australia, where Australia uh, tries very hard to persuade Indonesia and other Southeast Asian countries to accept refugees instead of allowing them to travel on to Australia. Another example of a global social problem that is endemic in semi-peripheral countries is high levels of pollution, uh, air, ground, and water pollution. Here I'll pick on India instead of China. This is a photo from New Delhi, and uh, usually we are, we're used to hearing about the catastrophic pollution levels in Chinese cities, but in fact, New Delhi has worse pollution than any major city in China, worse air pollution in any major city in China. <clears throat> High levels of air pollution are, like those found in New Delhi and Beijing, are pretty typical of cities all around the world. Uh, the few cities that enjoy blue skies and clean air are concentrated in core countries. Uh, most of the urban dwellers of the world live in cities like New Delhi, not in cities like Sydney and San Francisco. Semi-peripheral countries may be the most common victims of global social problems, but they're also complicit in the creation of those problems. Uh, social problems are not only created by the core and pushed out to the semi-periphery. Uh, the semi-periphery is uh, part of the problem as well. A big reason is that most semi-peripheral states lack transparency and have poor accountability to their own people. Corruption is endemic at all levels, uh, at, at national, state, uh, provincial, and local levels, uh, as well as within corporations. And states are governed in the interests of small ruling elites. In this situation, uh, it's no surprise that semi, many semi-peripheral countries are complicit in taking on the problems of the world, uh, as long as those problems can be shoved down to the majority of the population who are not adequately represented uh, in the government and in the state. Most semi-peripheral states allow or even encourage uh, powerful companies from core countries to take advantage of their physical territories and of their people. Simply put, when studying global social problems, the semi-periphery is where the action is. Since most of the world is in the semi-periphery, it's inevitable that most of the world's problems will be too. Uh, the semi-periphery represents the typical experience of life on Earth. Thus, global social problems are really just the problems of the semi-periphery. It can be difficult for people who live in core countries to comprehend that. To give an example, the pollution levels found in China and India are typical of the world they're not actually extreme levels of pollution. Uh, 
uh, China and India alone make up more than one third of the world's population. So one third of the people of the world automatically live at Chinese and Indian levels of pollution, and most of the rest do as well. The core experience of life on Earth is normative. We consider it normal to have uh, blue skies and clean air and drinkable water and uh, electricity 24 hours a day and responsive government. Uh, but even if that is normal, um, it's nonetheless unusual. Um, and I should stress that it's not just us who consider it normal. Uh, I've heard over and over again in my travels in semi-peripheral countries, people say that they simply wished they lived in a normal country by which they mean a country like uh, those in Western Europe and North America. Um, well, they want to live in a normal country where government functions and the environment is livable, but that's not a typical country. In fact, the typical country of the world is quite pathological. Key takeaways. First, semi-peripheral countries have functioning state institutions that nonetheless fall short of ideals on many dimensions. Second, semi-peripheral states are often complicit in social problems due to a lack of transparency, poor accountability, and corruption uh, that lead to governments that represent only a small minority in the country instead of the broad majority. Finally, the semi-peripheral life experience is typical of the world but is not considered normal even by inhabitants of the semi-periphery. Thank you for listening to this lecture. To find out more about me, go to salvatorbonus.com, where you can also register for my monthly newsletter on current affairs.